Greetings. I'm Sarah Carroll, the Executive Director of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, and I'm delighted to be here with you this morning as we look back at our first 50 years with an eye toward the future. I have been um, at the Commission for more than two decades, and I have been honored to work with such incredibly talented and dedicated staff and commissioners, and I think that all of their efforts will be reflected in this survey of our work during the past 50 years. New York City Mayor Robert F. Wagner signed the Landmarks Law in April 1965. This was a decade of social awareness movements and a new national awareness about preservation. This decade saw the National Pre Historic Preservation Act and the Archaeological Historic Preservation Act signed into law, the Columbia University protests, the Stonewall Inn riots, and the Weatherman explosion in Greenwich Village. The commission acted quickly, and in the first decade, more than 10,000 buildings became landmarks, including 443 individual structures and 26 historic districts. Not surprisingly, this was a decade of frequent firsts, including the city's first individual landmark, the Wyckoff House in Brooklyn, and the city's first historic district, Brooklyn Heights, containing 1,375 mostly residential buildings, as well as individual landmarks in each of the other four boroughs. Major monuments like the former United States Custom House on Bowling Green, Sailor Snug Harbor, and various religious structures won recognition, as did the Weeksville Houses in Brooklyn and the Dunbar Apartments, a pioneering example of cooperative housing for middle-class African Americans in Harlem. In 1973, the Soho Cast Iron Historic District was designated Unlike previous historic districts, which were primarily residential, this lower Manhattan neighborhood was recognized for its commercial origins and innovative construction materials. The first interior landmark, the entry hall and stairs of the main building of the New York Public Library, and the first scenic landmark, Central Park, were also designated in this decade. The commission also started to award certificates of appropriateness for new buildings, such as the Watchtower Building, a refined, almost brutalist design in Brooklyn Heights, and 18 West 11th Street on the site of the Weatherman explosion in Greenwich Village. The expansion of the Metropolitan Museum of Art with its pyramidal stairs was approved in 1969. This was the first of many occasions when the commission worked with leading cultural institutions, guiding growth and preservation of their physical complexes. While the Landmarks Law was signed in 1965, it would not be until 1973 when the law was amended to include publicly accessible interiors and scenic landmarks. In 1966, the law had its first challenge by the Manhattan Club, and the court held that promotion of the general welfare of the city includes historic preservation, that designation was not a taking, and that the commission's decision was entitled to deference. In the decade from 1975 to 1984, the city saw more turmoil with a fiscal crisis, the blackout of 1977, and the shooting of John Lennon. But there was continued celebration of the built environment and historic resources during this time. The Statue of Liberty is restored in 1984. The Federal Historic Preservation Fund was established in 1977, and the New York State Historic Preservation Act was signed into law in 1980. Not only did the U.S. Supreme Court recognize historic preservation as a legitimate public purpose in the Grand Central Terminal decision of 1978, but the Landmarks Law had been amended in 1973 to include publicly accessible interiors and scenic landmarks like Bryant Park and Central Park. And while the first interior designation at the New York Public Library occurred in 1974, 37 interiors would follow by 1984 and 56 more were added by 1995, including memorable office building lobbies, theaters, and banking halls. The commission also designated 22 historic districts and 268 individual landmarks, including Boys High School in Bedford-Stuyvesant, our first public school, the Lascaz House, our first modern building, and Lever House, our first post-World War II building, designated in its 30th year, as well as our first suburban historic district, Prospect Park South, 
and the street plan of New Amsterdam, designating a site, not the buildings, and regulating the sole surviving traces of the city's Dutch colonial settlement. An action of similar character would take place in 1993 when the African burial ground in Commons, an archaeological subsurface historic district was in the vicinity of City Hall was designated. In terms of new buildings, the commission continued to favor diverse approaches, including both modernist and contextual additions. Notable projects included the Eichner Townhouse in Brooklyn Heights, the so-called Witch's Hat Building on 7th Avenue South in Greenwich Village, and the new Bogardus Building, which recalls the cast iron fronted Lang stores, which was disassembled with plans for reconstruction at the South Street Seaport. The commission also approved a 50-story hotel preserving the McKim, Mead, and White, preserving McKim, Mead, and White's remarkable Villard houses. The decade from 1985 to 1994 saw Black Mon the Black Monday stock market crash, but it also saw the opening of the Apollo and the redesigned Bryant Park, a surge in investment in real estate, and Mayor David Dinkins became the city's first African-American mayor. By the end of the decade, we experienced the first World, War Trade, World Trade Center bombing. During this decade, the commission designated a total of 4,864 buildings and received 33,551 permit applications, a significant jump from the 2,374 applications received in the first decade and the 8,570 received in the second decade. In this third decade, a large number of mid-20th century modern buildings came of age. Now 30 years or older, an important group of iconic works become landmarks. Frank Lloyd Wright's Cass House on Staten Island, the Guggenheim Muse Museum and its interiors, and Aero Saarinen's TWA terminal and its interiors at Kennedy International Airport. The legendary cyclone roller coaster in Coney Island also won recognition, as did the parachute jump and the Wonder Wheel. Furthermore, 24 historic districts were designated, such as the Ladies Mile Historic District, with, it, with its soon-to-be revitalized retail corridors lining Broadway, Fifth, and Sixth Avenues. And as I mentioned earlier, the commission designated its first archeological historic district, the African Burial Ground and Commons in 1993. This period was also marked by unsuccessful legal challenges to the Landmarks Law. These included a 1988 to 92 effort by theater owners to overturn the designation of 22 Midtown Playhouses, as well as the St. Bartholomew's Church and Community House case in which the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit refused to exempt a religious organization from the requirements of the Landmarks Law. The Commission approved new buildings during this period in such important districts as Greenwich Village and Brooklyn Heights. Preservation projects that garnered considerable attention during this period included the Siemens Church Institute on Water Street, as well as notable additions to the Jewish Museum, the atrium at the Morgan Library, and Cody Rizzoli stores. Highlights during the next decade of 1995 to 2004 include the first time an apartment sells for more than $2,000 per square foot, the first time in New York City history that the population tops 8 million, and an economic boom in the first half of the decade, and of course the September 11th terrorist attacks. In this decade, the Commission continued to see increasing numbers of permit applications, receiving over 69,000 applications. The number of designations fell somewhat between 1995 and 2004, but the Commission continued to break ground, designating the first World's Fair structure, the Unisphere and surrounding uh, reflecting pool, and Governor's Island Historic District, now a remarkably popular summertime refuge as well as the glorious Lowe's Paradise Theater on the Grand Concourse and the Brown Building, the site of the tragic Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1911. Many new buildings and additions were likewise approved with works by both New York City architects 
as well as such international figures as Aldo Rossi, Jean Nouvel, Norman Foster, and Renzo Piano. Other significant additions approved during this decade that explored a contemporary approach juxtaposed against the historic fabric include the Rose Center for Earth and Space, the Harvard Club, Higgins Hall at Pratt Institute, the Brooklyn Museum, and Towers Nursing Home. In 1998, the Landmarks Law was amended, creating an administrative enforcement system, leading to a 2005 amendment allowing for administrative demolition by neglect actions. Two important amendments that strengthened the Landmarks Law and the agency's ability to enforce it. This last decade saw Plan YC released, an economic recession, a continuing increase in population, and Hurricane Sandy. It also saw a renewed interest in the intersection between culture and the built environment with public art projects such as the Christo and John Claude installation, the gates in Central Park, and the opening of the first phase of the High Line. Mayor de Bill de Blasio became the 109th mayor on January 1, 2014. Since 2005, under Mayors Michael Bloomberg and Bill de Blasio, the Commission has designated more than 10,600 buildings, exceeding the first fruitful decade. Of particular note were six public swimming pools built by the Works Progress Administration in the mid-1930s, the Domino Sugar Refinery, and Japan Society, as well as the Stonewall Inn, the first building designated for its connection to the LGBT community and the beginnings of the gay rights movement. In recent years, the number of permits issued by the Commission has reached record levels, with over 116,000 permit applications received. New buildings continue to be approved in all areas of the city, and the Commission has tackled projects with complex and difficult histories, such as the development called Historic Front Street in the South Street Seaport, and the St. Vincent's Hospital site, where the Commission heard and approved successive medical and residential structures in 1980 and 2015. The Front Street project was particularly challenging, requiring the restoration of numerous historic structures, as well as the construction of four new buildings. Like many previous projects, we embraced strategies that responded to the site and its history. For instance, the facades that face Peck Slip have a contemporary character, while those along both sides of Front Street have a more contextual approach. The St. Vincent's Hospital site likewise reflects the Commission's ability to balance civic and preservation goals. As at the seaport, the Commission worked closely with the owners and architects to preserve the existing historic structures while integrating new construction into the surrounding historic fabric. The Commission also considers new challenges of sustainability and resiliency. For instance, we approved the adaptive reuse of the former Lion House in Astor Court at the Bronx Zoo in 2002, completed in 2008 and now occupied by the popular primates exhibit Madagascar. This was the first time that the restoration of a landmark building received gold lead certification. And in the last decade, many projects have gone on to receive lead certification. Complex and innovative projects such as these demonstrate the vital role the Commission plays and will continue to play in New York City, shaping not only the evolving character of the historic structures, but also how such practices are viewed throughout the state and nation. As we have seen over the last 50 years, the Landmarks Law has been resilient and flexible in adapting to changing economic, social, and cultural events. We have to plan ahead for more change including changing demographics, issues of equality, and climate change. And while we can't anticipate every new challenge in the next 50 years, we are confident that through the Landmarks Law and our practices, we can meet those challenges and protect New York City's architecturally, historically, and cultural, culturally significant landmarks and uh, buildings and sites. Thank you. <laughs>